my channel. So today's video is definitely the most requested Jane slash John Doe case that you guys gave me when I announced that I was having a Jane John Doe series and I wasn't planning on necessarily doing this video but the amount of times you guys asked me if I would I decided I would just go ahead and dive right on into it. I do want to give a quick Warning Rick before I get into this video, I will be posting some pictures that might be upsetting to some people. Um, this case does involve a young child and post-mortem pictures. If you're not aware of what that means, it's pictures of someone after death. So I just wanted to make you guys aware of that before you kind of get yourself into a video that might be upsetting for you. Um, and it does also touch on a couple more very sensitive subjects such as sexual assault and um, abuse of a child. So I just wanted to throw that out there. From that, I'm sure a lot of you can guess, and from the title, that today's video is on the boy in the box. And people have asked me to do this video since my first video I ever made. I don't know what it is about this case that's so incredibly intriguing, um, but this is one of the most well-known John Doe cases there is out there. February 25th of 1957, a little boy between the ages of three years old and seven years old was found in a cardboard box in a wooded area in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, two different people saw his remains before anyone even called the police. The first one was a young man who was checking his muskrat traps and he was scared that the police would take his traps away so he decided to not report the body. Then the following day another young man saw this boy. He claimed that he saw a bunny rabbit run into the bushes so he stopped his car to look at it. I thought that was a very strange story so I looked it up and he apparently had been spying on a girl from his school and that's the real reason he was in the woods and because of that he decided to not tell the police for about 24 hours. So on the 26th, police finally were able to open an investigation about this little boy that had been found. His body was wrapped in a blanket and he had been put into a box that was originally a box for a bassinet that you got from J.C. Penney. His body was covered in bruises and the medical examiner said that before death he had received multiple blows to the head. His hair had recently been completely buzzed off, which was pretty obvious because clumps of his hair were found stuck to his body. He had surgical scars on his ankle, groin, and then a very strange L-shaped scar underneath his chin. He only weighed roughly 30 pounds and was 40 inches tall, and according to the medical examiner, this just proved exactly how malnourished he was. He should have been somewhere between the ages of three and seven, but he was hitting all of the measurements for roughly a two-year-old. And x-rays just further proved this when they showed that there was arrested growth. His lips were very dry and bloody, and he was so incredibly emaciated that his ribs were showing from under his skin. They also found that he might have had some sort of eye infection, which could have possibly been from living in a dirty environment, had been treated with some sort of medication before death. However, they weren't able to really nail this down as 100% fact. They couldn't even really determine when the exact time of his death was because Philadelphia was so cold in that time that he could have been there for days or weeks. So they couldn't even get a solid answer on that, which was extremely upsetting. They decided to take his fingerprints and just hope that they were quickly able to identify this little boy. Over 400,000 flyers were made and put up all over Philadelphia and they were sent to thousands upon thousands of different police departments around the country in hopes that someone would see the poster and recognize this little boy, but not a single person came forward. So they went to pretty drastic measures. Um, they took the little boy's body and they posed it in a picture that made him dressed and appear as if he was just sitting down casually and they then took all of these photos and put them all over Philadelphia and sent them to other departments as well. But still, even after this very scary, I guess, length they went to, no one came forward to claim this little boy. This is all of the information they had from him that they had released at the time. And so a lot of theories really started spinning. This gained so much attention from different investigators and different medical examiners who found this incredibly bizarre way this boy was found and the very weird 
things that had happened to him before he had died. The largest theory was that he had come from a foster home. A man named Remington Bristow was a medical examiner and he was in contact with a psychic who told him that there was a man and woman who had turned a mansion into a foster home. The psychic said that they were pretty sure this is where the boy came from. So Bristow went everywhere and tried to locate this specific foster home and eventually found it one and a half miles away from where the boy's body was found. He had interviewed the family at one point and came up with nothing and then eventually the family moved away and had an estate sale. So Bristow went to the estate sale and found some alarming items in the home. There was a bassinet in the home that was identical to the one that would have been in the box that the boy was found from. It was from J.C. Penney. Literally everything matched perfectly. There were blankets hanging on the clothesline that exactly matched the blankets that the boy had been found wrapped in. He started coming up with a theory to what he believed might have happened. The man running the foster home had a stepdaughter and Bristow strongly believed that this stepdaughter gave birth to a son illegitimately. Um, at this time, it was widely, widely frowned upon to have a child out of wedlock. It's a little bit different now, it's a little more widely accepted, but this was something that was extremely sinful, extremely bad to do. He believed the death of the boy was possibly an accident, but that instead of taking the boy in and pretty much having the stepdaughter seen as a mother out of wedlock, they decided to just get rid of the boy himself. However, in 1998, police interviewed the man and the stepdaughter and were able to almost 100% rule out that they had any sort of relation to this little boy. Even a DNA test was done on the stepdaughter and it was not the same DNA as the boy in the box, so this pretty much ruled it out completely. I do find it strange though that there are so many weird connections with this family, what was found inside of their home. But then that theory was taken over by another theory. The theory was that he belonged to a man named Kenneth Dudley and his wife Irene Dudley. Mr. Dudley was a carnival worker and in 1961 an investigation into his family was started. They had 10 children in total and they were really put under the microscope when their seven-year-old daughter turned up dead from malnutrition and neglect. They didn't bury her and instead just wrapped her in a blanket and placed her in the woods, which was exactly how the boy in the box had been found. Authorities then realized that seven out of the 10 Dudley children had died from the exact same causes of malnutrition and neglect and not a single one of them had been given a proper burial. This seemed like that much more evidence, but when they dug deeper into it, they soon found out that none of these children were the boy in the box and he still was nameless. This brings me into what I think is the most possible theory in this case. In 2002, a woman who only goes by the name of M came forward and knew a lot of information that had not been released by the police. M said her mother was very, very abusive physically and sexually and had purchased this little boy, the boy in the box, but to them his name was Jonathan and he had been purchased from his parents in the summer of 1954, which means he was at the very least three years old. The boy was then subjected to extreme physical and sexual abuse from the mother and was forced to live in the basement, which could explain the infection in the eye, could explain the malnutrition, um, could explain why he seemed a lot younger than he was and the arrested development because he was forced to live in this basement. He probably wasn't fed, he probably was chained somewhere or something or another, so that could explain a lot of the story. M claimed that one night they had eaten baked beans for dinner and then the boy got sick and the mother got extremely, extremely angry about this and threw the boy against the floor repeatedly. He became unconscious to which she put him in the bathtub and washed him off and at some point during his bath he ended up passing away. Details from M's story absolutely shocked police because something they had never released to the public before was that the contents of his stomach when he was found were baked beans and his fingertips had been shriveled and wrinkled as if he had been submerged in water around the time of his death. However, the medical examiner did not determine his death as drowning and that was one big thing that they couldn't really figure out but this bath explained completely. M then claimed that her mother cut this boy's hair because the 
most distinctive trait about him was that he had beautiful long hair. So in order to conceal his identity after he had died, they just haphazardly shaved it away. M said that her mother then forced her to help dispose of his body. They pulled off along the side of a country road and just as they were about to take him out of the trunk, a male drove by and pulled over and asked if they needed any help with anything, assuming maybe they were having car troubles. M's mother then ordered her to stand in front of the license plate so that no one could get any of their information and possibly linked them to the crime, which she did, and eventually the man drove off after being told no help was needed. This also shocked police because a male witness had come forward right after the boy was found, claiming this sort of situation happened. Unfortunately though, police were not able to verify her story. They went and talked to her neighbors that had lived beside her at the time. These neighbors claimed they went over to the house frequently and they spotted no boy. And they also said that M's claims were in their terms ridiculous. M also had a past with mental illness, so they couldn't really believe everything that she said. However, to me, I 100% think this story is very, very possible, and I'll get into even more details as to why I think that. There is another theory that I think goes hand in hand in this, and it's that people think this little boy was forced to grow up as a girl. He had long hair, which they had evidence of because clumps of it were attached to his body. There was even a sketch made of him to show what he would have looked like if his hair had been long, which is what it would have been before death. His eyebrows had also been shaped and tweezed to look more feminine. And something that I didn't see in this connection and I couldn't find more information on is that he had some sort of surgery in his groin region. M knew a lot of information that police hadn't given out. I'm talking very small, insignificant seeming things like eating baked beans for dinner and taking a bath. Things that you don't really think would totally crack open a case, but she knew all of it somehow. I think it's very possible that her mother did buy this little boy as a baby, but I think she wanted a little girl instead of a little boy. But since I'm sure it's hard, to purchase babies, um, at least I hope it is. That sounds terrible to even talk about. It's very possible that since she did use this child and her own daughter for uh, sexual reasons, that she wanted a little girl. There were signs of surgery on the groin region. I'm wondering if it was done by a professional or if maybe the mother tried to mutilate this little boy to appear more feminine, just like the eyebrows were tweezed to appear more feminine, just like his hair was long to appear more feminine. Um, if you are twisted enough to buy someone's child to sexually assault them and keep them as your slave, I don't think that's a very far-fetched idea. I think it's very possible that she tried to morph this little boy, which was the only thing she could get for herself at the time, into what she wanted, which is absolutely disgusting. It could also explain why the neighbors don't remember seeing a little boy running around. It's very possible that the boy in the box growing up didn't look like a little boy. If you think about kids when they are younger, especially when they're babies, everyone's like, oh, your daughter is precious. Okay, well, that's my son. At such a young age, you really can't tell. We all just look like human beings. So long hair on a little boy, he could look like a little girl, cut a little girl's hair off, she could look like a little boy. So maybe they didn't see a little boy because there wasn't a little boy there. Neighbors saw a little girl running around, they would just immediately toss it into the back of their brain as one of M's friends. So I think it's very possible they just didn't see a little boy because the little boy was made to look like a little girl. There's a lot of people who don't believe any of these theories whatsoever, but I think M might have been onto something. I think it's very possible she was telling the truth. Fortunately though, the identity of the boy in the box is still unknown to this day. When his body was exhumed in 1998, they took his DNA and put it on file just in case they could test it to someone in the future. He was then reburied and the headstone cast and plot of land was donated to the boy in the box 
by the son of the man who originally buried him in 1957. And on his headstone are the words, America's Unknown Child, which is the other name in which he is known by. Interestingly enough, I did find that in March 2016, investigators think they might have linked him to a family in Memphis, Tennessee, and from the last I have seen, they are attempting to compare DNA, but I couldn't find any more on this. I don't know 100% if it's true because I found it from a very limited amount of sources, but that would be crazy if this much later they were able to connect him. Maybe, you know, maybe he had been taken away from his family, or maybe it's the family that possibly sold him to M's mother. There's really no telling. Is he an unfortunate victim of the system? Maybe he was given up at birth and put into a horrible foster home. Maybe that one specific one just wasn't the one responsible for his death. I think there's no telling. There's so many possibilities here, but he was being physically abused. And unfortunately, children that are in that circumstance usually don't come into contact with a lot of people. The parents or whoever is taking care of this child more than likely don't want anyone to know that they are abusing this child, so the chances of them letting him out of the house was probably slim to none, which would explain why nobody has come forward. I think he led a very short and horrific and tragic life, which is heartbreaking, especially having children of my own and knowing what he possibly had to endure. So let me know what you guys think down below. I know this is a very popular one, so I know a lot of you will have your own theories and have your own research on it. If you have any more information, please don't forget to let me know about it down below. Share your theories, talk together. I love seeing you guys go back and forth about these cases that I cover. And on that note, I'm going to go ahead and go guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to check out all of my social media websites listed down below. Click the subscribe button to become a member of the family and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.